Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back to the Liberal Artist Podcast. I am your host, Bodhi Papula, and with me I have Kaylee Horowitz. Hello. <laughs> and Andy Gibby Gibson. Well, I guess you better like it hot because global warming's on the way, isn't it? Jesus God. No. All right. Um, <laughs> I have to I have to get something off of my chest before we get started. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um I am still uh actively homeless. <laughs> right, still on the Bodia Homeless Chronicles. Yeah. And um, the saga continues. <laughs> in that time, I've been bumming around in uh, South Florida, right? Yep. Nice. I am sick and tired of seeing old men with shirts off. <laughs> it doesn't happen every day, but it happens often enough to where I'm like, hey, if ladies have to wear a bra, my dude, you probably should look into investing in one. There's no rules. Put your shirt back on. There's one rule. But I yell that and for some reason I'm the asshole. I've seen (laughs) comics where they draw a male body and a female body the exact same as they're going to a beach. And the guy just goes, Jesus, Helen, put a shirt on. What if the children see it? And his boobs look exactly like hers do. (laughs) Right. I just I just didn't want to imagine what dudes are supposed to look like just like melted (laughs) honestly no that is like a a surprisingly consistent male body type in florida is like frustratingly consistent i don't understand like i i think that's the perfect word because i'm like i should i be concerned i i don't right is that just what 60 looks like (laughs) right have y'all heard of a new thing it's called the sun Ah, uh, like never it, heard of it. it. It'll get you eventually. I know that most of us live indoors most of our lives because we're nerds and basement dwellers and whatnot. But the sun's out there, and it's the gonna sun get is you a deadly eventually. Laser. <laughs> Absurd. Uh, I don't know. Well, here at the liberal artists, we promote body positivity. Unless, unless you're, you're running on... <laughs> around South Florida with all your sh- without your shirt on, then in that case, fuck you. Put it on. I wear slacks and a button up to work. I don't care if it's 100 degrees outside. I'm dressed up. Put on a goddamn shirt, homie. Like, that's the thing. For me, it's not like as a body shaming thing. It literally is that like context of place because mm-hmm. I lived and worked in St. Petersburg, which, yes, does live on the shoreline, like in the Tampa Bay pocket. But I was on the side of St. Pete that the water was right there, but that was like a harbor. Like, that's not beach. You have to go another 20 minutes west or south to get to the beach. There's, there's water. And it was still this like, it's it's a city. It's a downtown. And I'm like in it, like either in paint clothes ready to go to the theater or like going uh, like to get food before like an opening night of a show. And I'm a little dressed up and there would still just be these old white dudes. No shirt on at like four or five o'clock in the day. And I'm like, what? Where did you come from? Why are you here right now? Like, if if we were at the beach, I wouldn't bat an eye. Right. But, like, we're in a public park downtown, sir. Kaylee is not body shaming. I am not body... Er, I, I am. I am body shaming. Go fuck yourselves. Put on a shirt. I shame your body. Shame. Shame for your body. Stop Amish shaming put a, them. No. I'm going to put... I'm going to run around with a red marker, and I'm going to put the scarlet letter on all of their chest. Just L. <laughs> You've lost, sir. God damn, I was man. just going to wear one for fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. It's the same principle as whenever you're in a zombie apocalypse and you have long hair. They can get you. Florida doesn't have zombies yet. Yet. That I know of. They have the most incredibly powerful creature that walks on land and swims in the sea. Florida man. Well, there is that. That's true. That's a close number two right there. Oh, I'm talking about the gators. Like, and, and I'm not giving them any more chance to get me. If, if I've got a long flowing shirt or something like that, that's just another thing on me that they can try to grab. Yeah, right but I ain't, I ain't seeing no gators outside the fucking Publix. Bro. You haven't been to the right parts of Florida. How then? long have you been living in I, Florida? I'm in, I'm in old rich people Florida right now. That's fair. You're in old rich people Florida. The ga- they- if you run into a gator, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> you were looking for one and you were looking for trouble. 
you can level up as a Floridian in a lot of different ways, but there is a really cool route where you are Floridian enough to have been able to just take one of the do not molest the gator signs and hang it up in your house. <laughs> That's badass. And if you've seen one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Every place there is a body of water. That was the choice says, of language. Do not, it says do not molest the gators. I mean. Every single one. Do not take advantage of the gators. Do not groom the gators. <laughs> I'm just saying that's not the word that I would have used. I mean, do not feed the gators. Do not touch the gators. Not like do not start messaging the gators over kick when you know the gator but is the, in junior high. Do or not something text like the gator that. at 2 a.m. You up. Florida public health slash like wildlife conservation groups. They went. This is the public awareness language we're going to use on the sign. Do not molest the gators. Yeah. Even though we also have like. Do not feed the wildlife and like other more normal things floating around. And I've never seen in any other state where they have to tell you not to molest the wildlife. Uh -huh. Like in those words, it is only Florida that I have seen that kind of signage. Do not slide in the gators DMs. <laughs> <laughs> Do not tutor the, the gators in algebra homework and then no. message them saying things <laughs> like, I miss you. Do not bring the gators to Catholic Mass. Oh, uh, man, you, you, you just see a gator in a sanctuary and somebody's about to touch it. And the guy from To Catch a Predator just shows up like, why don't you have a seat on that log over there, sir? And then the gator eats him. Because yeah! he's a gator. To Catch a Predator would have been so much better if a gator ate the pedophiles at the end of every If they were episode. literal predators? <laughs> to Catch a Predator with a Predator. I want to I want to catch a predator where it's like a, a animal planet series about like chasing like the world's most dangerous predators or exactly catching <laughs> sexual predators with animal predators. Oh, like, my God. Could, could you have imagined ratings. the ratings boom if at the end when like a 50 year old man with a case of Bud Light walks in expecting to meet. A 14 year old, he chatted with a chat room on the internet and they just it's open just a, a door that's full of lions. 400 pound gator. Oh. <laughs> There's oh. lions in one episode. They, in the pool episode, they've just got a great white shark in there. Oh, I was going to say, no. Nah, <laughs> screw, screw the shark. Screw the shark. Go with a hippo. Do oh, not yeah. screw the shark. No, please don't screw with the shark either. Do, Do not, not molest, molest the, the shark. shark. <laughs> <laughs> the shark probably wouldn't want to eat you. The hippo would just kill you for fun. This is true. That's the thing. The hippo is better because it can go on land Hippos and are killing water. machines. Hippos are kill all pure muscle. They're like bodybuilders. They just look chunky. I want to see someone that deserves to get deck get absolutely destroyed by a kangaroo. <laughs> yeah. You know? Again, like, have you ever just like wanted somebody predator. to get so utterly dead? But like, have you seen how buff they get? They are I'm terrifying. Aware. It's true. It's true. Kangaroos are so muscular and it's scary. It's intimidating. Not only that, like usually they have their head positioned where one, they're flexing their pecs at you. And two, their head is kind of back like this where it's just like. Right. They really look like you want to go, bro. You want to go. You want to fucking scrap? How do we you want to how, do, how, do, how did we get here? Look, I, I, I was know. complaining about old men, shirtless old men. And now we're talking about punish the human shirtless old combat. men with the kangaroos. I would say make the old men fight the kangaroos. There you go. There it is. Here at the liberal <laughs> artist uh, pod, we sanction blood sport. Apparently, we, we don't condone <laughs> violence unless it's something we don't like. Yeah. The Liberal Artists 2024. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at fear of future employment, because I'm being recorded and we're putting this on the internet. By choice. Um, let, let's uh, let's jump back in. We're talking about another classic movie, y'all. Um, we're running away from Japan for once. We've been there for a couple of weeks. Let's talk about Some Like It Hot. Classic 1950s film starring uh, the ever famous Miss Marilyn Monroe and some two other goons who I didn't know about. Some other goons. Some other goo. My God, man. 
Sorry, I have to put on my uh, my like Atlantic accent for introducing ah. this. Okay, go for it. Some Like It Hot, the classic film from 1959, starring Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, and Jack Lemmon as the principal actors. It is about 1929 Chicago. Guns, gals, lots and lots of booze. Holy shit, there's a lot of booze in yeah, this Yeah, it turns picture. out, you know, Prohibition era <laughs> should have taught us this. When you let the ultra conservatives decide how legislation happens, turns out shit gets pretty shitty. I'm not saying that for any reason in particular. Yeah, gee, gee I wonder. <laughs> it's like if you ban something, people will still get it. And yeah, go people get will it do themselves. it anyway, and they'll do it very illegally. Oh my yep. god! Oh wow. my gosh! Who would have believed? Who absolutely would have believed? Not me. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that like the movie was made in like the late 1950s which was also a very conservative time in America with like Ooh, the, betcha. I, the Eisenhower government and everything. And it was like the peak Dwight of D. like, you know, the classic Americana of nuclear family and, you know, like strong economy and strong government and all that. Which like, again, it's so funny when we talk about, oh, then the 50s were so wonderful because at the same time we were fearing nuclear fallout. Yep. Like, the only thing that was bright, happy, and shiny were all the advertisements. And those are the things that have stuck around. And they yeah. had, and to, like, they, they had to escape back into the, the world of the past of 30 years before. Like a, exactly. Like a traditional 30-year cycle that we see in media all the time. It's crazy. Don't trust the government. Back to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, there, there's nostalgia repeats. Like, I'm about to go do a research project looking at the Hippodrome Theater. People mm. in the 30s were nostalgic for those kind of performances at the very, like, turn of the century in the early 1900s. And then, yeah, we've got, again, in the late 50s, we're looking back at the 20s. Mm. Like, it, it is, like, on cue every 25-ish years. We just go, man, those times were great, right? This sucks right now. <laughs> Yeah, Beaver, Cleveland, and Ward, and all the rest are just like, man, I wish I would have you hit us up if you're a real 20s kid. <laughs> <laughs> hit the pound sign on your rotary phone if, and type real 20s kid after it. Yeah, you, you kind of lost that one, bud. Yeah, yeah. The, the, <laughs> it's not an exact science right there. Yeah, so the movie is about uh, Prohibition Era starts in Chicago. In Chicago. Chicago! And the Chicago. fucking bears still aren't winning. Why aren't the bears fucking winning? <laughs> the bears. Movie starts in Chicago, um, starring two jazz musicians. They see a mob hit. Shit gets whack. They... No, not just they see a mob hit. They see the Valentine's Day, the same Valentine's Day massacre. Or like the closest equivalent of such that you can yeah, show on like film. It... Yes, exactly. Like Capone shit. They then join an all-women's band um, by cross-dressing and pretending to be women. Uh, to escape. To escape, go down to Miami shenanigans ensue oh. lots of shenanigans holy crap shenanigans yeah. like uh this shenanigans ha -ha. Ha -ha. it's shenanigans for women i swear to god i'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans this movie is i i kind of can't believe it exists from like the the time that it was made and everything mm -hmm. why do you say that because for one thing uh, this movie effectively uh, put the, the Hayes Code in its coffin. Uh, the Hayes yeah. Code was the pre-movie like movie ratings for making sure that we didn't put the sins of man into motion Hold on to pictures. your hats, everyone. Gibby's getting into media studies and film professor mode. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep it really short and simple. Uh, the early movie industry was pretty damn unregulated so they could go wild with it as with any new art medium uh everybody goes let's do some crazy shit who's gonna stop us and effectively in 1934 the motion picture uh association made sure that hmm maybe we shouldn't show everything here's a list of 40 things you can't do right now or so and that code of 
restricting and censorship lasted from 34 pretty much into the, uh, I think it was roughly the early 60s, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit later than that, when the yeah. G, P, G, R, and then later uh, in usage, uh, PG-13 came into play. So instead of uh, limiting the movie on what it could show, they started putting a viewer discretion advised, you know, ratings and warnings before. Because this movie has cross-dressing, gangster violence, uh, making the law look kind of stupid here and there, lots of drinking, lots of uh, sexuality, and, like, uh, hormones. Women's legs. Women's oh, legs. God. Clavicle. How dare. Clavicles. <laughs> I mean, the, the big one, the really big one in uh, the, the Hayes clavicle. Code was the thigh. Yeah. The mm. inner thigh was the key to all of men's evils and women's <laughs> temptations if I they mean, see same. that inner thigh they'll turn into beatniks god damn it it's not about boob guys versus butts guys it's all about the thighs always has been this movie was so popular and so successful in uh its run to the point where it got multiple oscar nominations and even a win they basically said, fuck, we got to change this. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said fuck or else I'll be in trouble. <laughs> then I'll get in trouble with the Motion Picture Association. And I am the Motion Picture Association. So it essentially, like, nailed down the coffin on, like, an archaic, crazy uh, censorship uh, sort of regulation and helped make movies as big as they are today when they were just like, hey, Maybe we should stop trying to ban all this stuff because I think that's we've... what happens <laughs> when your country decides to be fascist. Your movies are required, quote unquote, to be a certain way. And then you flip the bird and do something else anyways. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, not only that is it surprising that it exists, but it really holds up. Hot yeah. diggity. It really holds up. Yeah. And like <laughs> surprisingly, I, no, and I, I, in a weird way, I'm like, I don't. This is the first thought I had, and I, I don't know. I maybe I just need to go back and rewatch this other movie now because I've only seen it four times, and maybe the fifth time will like, oh, what about this? But I think this one actually, like, some like it hot. I think holds more water, mm-hmm. like, because people always make the argument, oh, you couldn't make Blazing Saddles today, and it's like, well. Yeah, you could. Do we need yeah, to make could. it today? I'm like, yeah, you could make it another way today for sure. Do we need to make it today? But also, like, comparatively looking at the two, there's like a what twenty ish year difference between. Uh, Some those like two it movies. hot is 1959, and I think Blazing Saddles is either mid or late 70s. Right. I was like, it's it's in the 70s, like solidly. Mm-hmm. That it's a like, yeah, no, and so, for some reason it's the like I think this holds up like as a as a full thing. Without having to, like, retroactive, like, oops, not this, like, Mm. any parts. Like, I think some like it hot holds more water than than Blazing Saddles, Um, but I do still love that movie. So this was your first time watching it, right, Kaylee? Yes. I, like, again, I've seen scenes of it, seen some of the musical numbers because it's Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. Um, and, And... there's also, fun fact, there's supposed to be a musical version of Some Like It Hot coming to hopefully Broadway nice. uh, in the next season. It'd be so a we'll revival. see how that goes. Uh, the musical has been, I think it's been on Broadway before, question mark. Maybe. Um, like, that's the thing. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that. But there's rumors going around it's coming back. Yeah, I hadn't heard of this before watching it. And mm-hmm. um, I don't think... If we're talking about the direction of the conversation, I don't think talking about the story by itself is like worth it. <laughs> you know what I mean? In some ways, no. Uh, it's kind of a, a simple story here or there. Yeah. Like uh, two guys see something they're not supposed to, so they got to go into disguise to escape, and they wind up in funny situations because mm-hmm. of funny that. Funny haha times. But I think what's more, uh, what's worth discussion a little bit more is how those things are funny and like the writing and the acting and the performances of it. So 
this was the first time that uh that both of you had watched it before i've seen it like once yeah. or twice what were your like initial things that you really enjoyed about it uh bo what what was something that you, really stood out to you i like the wordplay man <laughs> y- y- you know they 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 start out it start cold open mm-hmm. um they're talking to the dude named charlie and he's like okay charlie okay charlie no problem charlie and then he's like Hey, you can't tell them that it was me or it's good night, Charlie. And he's like, all right, good night, Charlie. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> that's funny. You can already tell it's going to be so good just from that. Yeah, I didn't find any of the jokes like laugh out loud funny, right? Like yeah. I was never like slapping the knees or whatever. Hmm. But there were a number of times I was like, oh, dude, that's that's really good. Or, <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah, I see what you did there. It, you it's know it's I mean? really fucking clever. Uh, mm. in, in a lot of moments right there like like just the like like when they're on the beach and uh joe is like trying to pose as a wealthy oil baron and like he holds up a shell and marilyn monroe's just like you're from shell oil and he's just like mm-hmm. yes yeah yes i am <laughs> uh it, it's very fast and, and very clever yeah. with its writing and its wordplay and everything like Kaylee, did you have uh, some thoughts on that in particular or favorite oh. lines or scenes? Oh, I was going to say, I can't think of like specific line, but oh mm-hmm. my God. I, I think this was like one of the only times I was like actually yeah. laughing out loud was the the night scene on the train. Yeah. Right. Because holy hell, that is in some ways most sleepovers i have been to dog that, that shit like, was just relatable it, it, no like it, it's that like hey hey like I, i'm gonna go get this okay oh oh you're awake hey we're gonna go do this thing yeah. okay okay and then somehow everybody is awake again and it's like why do we try going to bed it's a scene where it's um sugar and daphne are the characters names. yeah they're mm-hmm. just having a drink daphne, in their, quote unquote yeah daphne in quotations yeah um they're having a drink in their uh, railroad car. And not like, and I say railroad car, I mean more like railroad bunk. The bunk. Yeah, yep. they're all in the same car. Which is already hysterical that it's the like, okay, so we're all sleeping in the same car. Everybody's got their own bunk. <laughs> and, and like, exactly. Yeah. Like, and then oh. Sugar, sugar <laughs> calls somebody for like cocktail ice or whatever, which <laughs> proceeds to wake up everybody and they all stuff in. <laughs> to the same bunk and like everybody's been at that party where it's like this is gonna be me and like four other people and then like 30 people show up and you're just sitting in the corner with a drink in your and, like, hand like what happened it, though everybody's <laughs> got oh. these tiny little like train cups and like some other girls are like i brought little cakes i brought crackers and cheese and it, there's there is so like to kind of summate like where all of the humor in this movie is coming from because i feel like we can talk about this in a different section but the like it's easy to be critical of the like man in dress kind of comedy Mm -hmm. but right this does such a good job of bringing literally everything else to put on top of it that that doesn't have to be the only joke carrying this like not only is he still trying to figure out like how to how to girl how to like communicate with the girls as girl but then, like, one, you've got physical comedy where, like, one by one, um, her her friend is waking up all the girls in the bunks. And it's the, like, everybody pokes their head, like, hey, hey, bunk number nine pokes the head out. Like, <laughs> da, da, da. hey, number 10 pokes the head out. And, like, so it's it's individual. And, like, more girls just keep waking up, like, and they keep pulling each other in. And then, two, they're all piled into this one bunk. <laughs> Not like, oh, it's a party in the car, but, like, that. That just it's like a twin bed, y'all. It's a <laughs> twin bed, and it's the like it's such good camp. Jerry it is, is so finally good. surrounded by women <laughs> and booze, and he <laughs> right. couldn't be a, he couldn't be any more miserable about Which, it. Which again, like, is mentioned in a previous scene where he's like, yeah. "When I was a kid, I wanted to be trapped in a bakery overnight, like just be surrounded by sweets," <laughs> and sort of implying like he wished it like. This is the bakery. I'd love to. And women oh are the sweets. That's the 1950s. Right. And so they, yum, do yum, 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 very, yum. they do a very good job of like anytime a character has the sort of like women whimsy wish, like they mm. might get it granted, but it's going to, at least on Jerry, it's going to backfire on him <laughs> miserably. 
uh, I, I, in some ways. I, I love that, like, so much of the humor kind of sounds like it could have been, like, a Rodney Dangerfield act here sure. or there. Yeah. Like, like the the quote that got me where what was when they were on the train and uh, Sugar Cane says, I come from a musical family. My mother's a piano teacher and my father was a conductor. Well, where did he conduct? On the Baltimore and Ohio train line where I'm just like, oh, shit, you got yeah. me. That was that's good. That's good. I know it's dumb, but it's good. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a very like. I mean, partly because the Hayes Code kind of went, all right, well, you can't show this. Mm -hmm. Nah. There was a shift in filmmaking because of that, like in response from the 30s, like through the 50s, basically, where we get the kind of like quippy, quick, coded Abbott and Costello kind of mm -hmm. humor like mm -hmm. like this exactly, where it's the like, hey, either you're with us and you're going to get this joke or you're not. We're, we're just going to keep going and that's fine. You don't think um, that's um, like a um, moment thing? Just like American humor, American comedy yeah. just used to be a lot more dry back then. Yeah. And what happened? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I anyway. <laughs> I, I, I think that like the movie also has the benefit of, you know, uh, being uh, made in the late 50s and looking back in hindsight because yes. this is Prohibition era, but it's like, right before stock market crash like it's yep. in mm -hmm. 1929 but not like yeah the day of the market crash which allows them to do funny historical jokes as well where it's just mm -hmm. like why do you have to paint everything so black suppose you got hit by a truck suppose the stock market crashes suppose yeah. the dodgers leave brooklyn where it's just like oh you you funny little shits i see what right. you did here no, like the, it's it's that nice. We're just far enough away from this that we can like mm -hmm. look at a pretty good like distance picture and make fun of it and find all of these things like on top of what we're responding to in the Hayes Code to like poke holes in, but also within the history of the time to poke holes in and marry the two to craft like the humor and the arc of where the story is going to go. I think the thing that I really like about it, like beyond just the the clever writing, is how energetic the movie is, like with their mm -hmm. performances and everything. Uh, like the the later climax when they're trying to escape the gangsters inside the Miami uh, manor and everything, and how like briefly Scooby Doo it well pre Scooby Doo Scooby Doo it gets there with chase sequences and all just just a little before Scooby -Doo. just that level of slapstick where it's not quite like three stooges and it's not like the great pie fight or anything like right. that but right <laughs> ahead of that and i love how much the actors throw themselves into the roles like whenever uh, uh whenever jack lemon is uh dressed as daphne and he tries to do like a little girlish giggle and everything or like the little mannerisms here and there where it's just like, oh, yeah, this is a man in the 20s and what he thinks a woman actually acts like yeah. and everything. Yeah. But how well he starts to swing in it. Yeah, I actually had the opposite opinion. And I think it's because I'm not used to a lot of my watching of this is I have to get myself out of like 2022 brain. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I found the energy was like really not low, mm -hmm. but like subtle and moderately paced, right? Like even mm -hmm. when it did climax, I was like, okay, but we're not too far from the energy of uh, my dude getting back into the hotel room and jumping in the, in the uh, hot tub with his uh, full <laughs> suit on. Right? I don't think that made it harder to watch for me. Mm -hmm. But I do, I, I, high energy isn't the word phrase I would use, right? I guess. The word, I think, would be camp. This is true. Because that's, I mean, it's, and that is what this movie is like as a touchstone right. in queer communities and especially in drag culture, like just the history of drag as a form of, of art and performance. Mm -hmm. uh, some like it hot is is like a permanent member of that roster because of the way that it's it's influence like kind of trickles down through the movies that come after it 
Mm -hmm. uh that that deal with the sort of like drag queens on road trip kind of like there's so many (laughs) things that pay homage in that way where like white chicks like it's priscilla queen of the desert too is the like we're on a road trip and like we're in drag the whole time like for different plot reasons but like there's a surprising number of things that do this like drag road trip yeah (laughs) like it it has a sticking point. So something I wanted to ask you about uh, with comparing uh, Some Like It Hot with other movies that feature cross-dressing as a big element of uh, the plot uh, as compared to something like Tootsie or mrs doubt see see right there that that reaction no, right does, there tootsie doesn't deserve to be around okay mrs doubtfire the movie can stay okay <laughs> so why though uh just because i'm not familiar with like the plot of tootsie and i've just got a general uh i haven't watched mrs doubtfire but i've seen like a couple scenes and everything what do you think you about this mrs doubtfire i i haven't okay all right deal mm. with it go go and think about that as you ponder upon a a lake a la throw or something like that anyway what do you think it is about this movie that helps it avert the same criticism that later things get when it comes to gender cross-dressing lgbtq uh themed media and everything like that so it words um (laughs) (laughs) it is one of those things and i've again i think i've mentioned him before in other episodes episodes god i can't talk today uh james summerton on youtube goes into so much queer media and like queer history as told through movies and television and he does such a nice job of like making everything sound like so well researched and smart and cohesive and i'm just kind of word vomiting but um, one of those things about some like it hot is like one, the humor like lands with you that in some ways it kind of like takes away some of the initial discomfort you might be experiencing if you're like a man in a dress, like mm. if, if that is something that offends your sensibilities, whatever, um, like the humor is one of those things and sort of that like that campy nature of like just how things work in this world where it's the like yeah he can steal this guy's glasses and his suitcase and be down on the beach dressed as a millionaire and then make it all the way back to the hotel room to have jumped in the bathtub like that level of camp of Mm -hmm. like the way that things just work um kind of lets your guard down in some ways yeah and and kind of allows you to enjoy the plot a little bit more which i think mrs doubtfire like in a very different way and and again in the 90s where it's that sort of like there's some things in here that work great there's some things in here that like yeah the 90s suck i grew up i I, I was i was there y'all i grew up in the 90s i i was six when they ended but still like (laughs) close enough i I, 90 the 90s were not cool stop saying it yeah People just say the 90s were cool because we weren't as involved with the giant military thing and the Soviets, you know, weren't a problem anymore and 9-11 hadn't happened. The 90s suck. Yeah, they get a pass for all that. Sorry, Kaylee. <laughs> and I, again, I don't like, I don't claim like that Missed Outfire is like, oh, but it's such, it's so good. Like, it's a fun movie. Mm-hmm. But I think it like it is the performance of Robin Williams that makes that a likable character despite mm-hmm. the circumstances because he is kind of an asshole at first. And it's funny to kind of see him struggle, but we do find a like heart of performance within that character and like why he's doing what he's doing, even though it's the sort of like you were just directly told to stay away from your children. And like the mm, Yeah, the context is super important. This. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Versus versus something like Tootsie, which is a little bit more like it's more of a like weird sexual plot and like I'm just trying to like get what I want sort of thing. And like I've this is the the quickest way for me to like like not like not get caught, be able to get what I'm looking for, yada yada. Like So so what do you think the difference is between that 
and the plot, like the romantic subplot of Joe and Sugarcane in this movie as he dresses up not just as a woman, but also as a millionaire to mm-hmm. fool this somewhat ditzy and flighty, beautiful woman like into ro- romancing her. Mm. If, I'm, if I may. Um, yes. I don't think... I think, and I'm not justifying this, I'm saying I think this is why the movie gets away with it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't dress as a woman with the intent to seduce her. And I think that's the difference, right? It was just by happenstance. It was by happenstance. Mm-hmm. And then while, as they're having the conversation on the train, he does take yeah. advantage of that conversation, which is shitty, but that's, oh, again... Uh, uh, I think within the context of the film, he's a shitty dude. Um, <laughs> I will say the resolution is what I found the least satisfying about the movie. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember like seeing the final cr- confrontation with the big mafia party and whatnot. The Italian Opera Society. <laughs> yeah, the Italian Opera Society, <laughs> um, which is funny. Um, and thinking... Okay, I still have like half an hour left in this movie. I'm right. sitting there and it's nope. like, nope, there's like four minutes left. I'm, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> here we go. Spoilers. He gets the girl. The other dude just fuck him, I guess. The yeah. resolution, either it was just style of the film, style of the time, right? Where it's like, yeah, it's a comedy. It has to resolve. The guy has to get the girl. Yeah. Right. Or, or they just didn't care to deal with that. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that's I think that's why this movie can get a pass is basically what I'm yeah. saying. He, I get that. Yeah. he 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 actually goes back into gender norms. He lies, but he goes back to gender norms in order to seduce her and yeah. um have their one night stand, but they're in love, so it's okay, whatever. <laughs> no, and I, I think it's it I would say it's a testament to the way they approach the script structure mm-hmm. because it feels so much like playing with film archetypal beings as opposed to making a character character okay. you know yeah like it it feels very much like we have our lead guy we have supporting best friend sort of sort of guy like maybe he could be the lead but no he's not the one with the love interest he's the one right. having to put up with the old man schmuck that thinks he looks beautiful in a dress yeah. sort of thing um and then we have the the ingenue who like comes like right out and says it on the train. She's like, Oh no, I am dumb. Like it's <laughs> kind of, like plays it off as a joke and talking about like her past relationships. She's like, I shouldn't have. I'm dumb and I'm easy. Love yeah, me. Like, <laughs> honestly, kind of iconic behavior where but I'm just really like, I, I do. Mm, no, okay. I, I'm, Bob, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. What I'm saying is <laughs> I, sh- that sounds like a good plan for like a, my own summer here. Or there just to be like, Hey, what's up? <laughs> You, you play the saxophone? All right, come get me, baby. I'm <laughs> I'm dumb and I'm easy. Welcome to I'm hot here to Gibby do summer. hot Gibby stuff. We're on some hot Gibby shit up in here. Forget <laughs> hot girl summer. Come get me, ladies. I'm your himbo of the season. Okay. Catch him on a beach in Florida hunting for millionaires. Not melted, thank God. Not melted, baby. I am straight. No, you gotta up wear the cute little it. '50s bathing suits that's got like the booty shorts built into it, but like not like booty short, booty short, but like literally like covers your butt cheeks, and, like and it looks else. like you're wearing a, a top <laughs> and shorts attached to the same article of clothing, and it's oh, not very man. flattering. I got derailed though. I don't yeah, know what we were yeah. The train, about. the train is gone. We got to get out of hot Gibby summer. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I really do like, uh, like the, the Joe and sugarcane romance is like yes. good fifties comedy. I yeah. really enjoy the, uh, Jerry slash Daphne, like all the scenes um, of him with like the older, like millionaire and all that, mm-hmm. because I kind of love how much he gives into like the act and everything. Yeah. Like the tango scene is one of my favorites God. just because of like how like uh how energetic the dancing is as well as just like ah uh, I don't know what it exactly is about it but I just really 
enjoy their performances and you like <laughs> the, the vibe fact, i like i like the aesthetic i like the vibe it's a good time and you know the thing that uh, really made me laugh was like after they find after we find out they're engaged and he's still like shaking the maracas as he's sitting in bed like uh his his joe comes up to him and says you're not a girl why would you want to marry a guy for security uh, I mean, which is very, no, like, there's funny. so many great moments <laughs> where, like, he's it's such a good performance because it is not a like, I don't want to say like it's a transition slash a transition mocking story, like, because it's no. not that, like, it is definitely not, but that's sometimes a thing that happens where it yeah. is the like, oh, I just enjoy, I really actually enjoy wearing this now and I've discovered something about right. myself that's non-specific. The bit for... isn't that they're cross-dressing. The bit is that these guys are con men and they're they're realizing that this is like, yeah. that this is the way that they can make their money. And, where... they get lo- and they get lost in the con. Right, no, realizing <laughs> that the whole, like not just that they got caught up in witnessing a mob hit and they have to flee the city, Yeah, but literally the beginning of this movie is about I want to get out of here and go to Florida for three weeks because it's snowing and cold up here. Yeah. And it's not down there. And we can get it. We get there's a train that could take us. And people like, are trying to kill that's us. That's the whole. <laughs> Let's get yeah, going. Like, that's, that's the real instigator. But yeah. like the whole initial premise is it's cold. Let's leave. <laughs> <laughs> and I just find that so funny like seeing how all of these things just continuously develop and then keep going off the rails. Yeah. Because for Jerry, it is that level of like there's moments where he really like seems to enjoy leaning into that performance of Daphne. But then there are other times where it is very clearly like this is a performance and I want to leave because you are creeping me out. Don't touch me Mm -hmm, like there there's there's a very interesting like. And I don't want to say back and forth like it's bad and inconsistent, but like just the way his character feels about this like Mm -hmm. is is it's exciting to see as representation in this sort of existence between like queerness it's like the most that could be even possible in the 50s right like where it's it is this level of like i mean yeah i'm getting there's some girl jokes like just being a girl things that we throw in here that are kind of funny but it's the real like humor of his character is the fact that the like he seems to enjoy the bit when he's with the girls. Like right. they're all having a great time just being girlfriends with one another. When Sugar calls him flat chested and he takes offense to it, is right. like, Dude, well, <laughs> I hate to tell you, but. <laughs> <laughs> are just like all of them out at the beach and like all in the matching like one piece swimsuits and they're all like just like like spiking the volleyball to each other like it's yeah. just this like yeah it's girl squad yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> women supporting women <laughs> he, he gets fully into the bit and like he sees that joe's trying to pull a fast one on sugar and he's just like Oh, you think you're real smart, do you? You think you're a real clever guy, huh? You think I don't see and what's And then Joe going says, on. I'm going to punch you. And he's like, yeah, do what you want. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, like the moment he like grabs the collar of the, the shirt, the dress is like, oh, okay. <laughs> and there are like n- near breakthrough moments here and there where like mm-hmm. the, the bellhop is hitting on Daphne. Oh, my God. And, uh, and he's just like, huh. So this is what women deal with all the time, huh? Which is right. like not to say this is a grand moment in like feminist film theory yeah. or anything, but I feel like it's the most that was like possible for a commercial release in the nineteen fifties. Yeah, I was gonna say this is your like early, early first wave feminism sort of thing. I, like sec- second wave. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that because I feel like there's. There's an argument to be had about intention. Yeah. And I don't think mm-hmm. the intention was ever to, this is what women go through. Look how what they have to go through. I no. think the intention was, I think the joke was, hey, all guys are pigs and we know we're pigs. Right. No, and that's the thing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, and that's why I'm like, I don't think it, it, it I, I agree. It's not intentional, but it still arrives at the same point, mm. except it's, except it is like, it's the same sentence. But with a very different tone. It's of it's voice, a difference in know? reading. It's it's a difference in reading the media, in the time it was released, 
and in the time that we're watching it now. Like there's yeah. going to be a different interpretation of things because we come from a different society and a, a different time period for like reading like, oh yeah, the pervy old man pinched your butt in the elevator and you're pissed about that. Maybe you will have some understanding and empathy for your sisters now that you're stuck. But no, of course not, because it's the 50s. And like, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's just how chauvinist things really could be at the time. Say that word again. Chauvinist. Chauvinist. God damn it. Oh, <laughs> fuck. I've only ever seen it written. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, damn it. I hate it it's when okay. you get me with these. <laughs> you are not going to let me live this down. I, I don't care that much because I'm a show. I'm a chauvinist. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Look, I have a familial curse with this stuff. Like my grandfather used to do these things all the time. My great grandpa used to confuse these words all the time and they passed that to me genetically i where guess i was just like i've got to go inside and wash my scallop and my mom was just like say it again and i'm like no, <laughs> no not again my scallops my yeah. scallop. <laughs> it happens all the oh time God, my scallops. I, mom i've got to go wash my scallop I don't have enough head and shoulders. What will happen to my scallops? No, no, no I've got to go wash my scallop. You mean your scalp? No, and you've just got like a handful <laughs> of like little, <laughs> little creatures. You have no idea. Do you know the vulnerability that I have to acquire to come onto an auditory medium and willingly so put brave. myself out? No, you're Thank not. you. Thank you. I am cursed, Bo. I am cursed and I am brave. You're cursed and I. Laugh at your curse. Ha 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 ha. Eat my ash, Bo. Wait, we fucking shit. present it. Uh, we, we, Bo and I really are the angel and devil on Gibby's shoulders. <laughs> I'll poke you with the tripod. Hee <laughs> hee. You, you swip. Oh, uh, fuck. Damn it. You said you couldn't talk. Look what's happening to me. I'm melting like an old man in Florida. Yeah, ah! man. You really got to wipe all that sweat off of your scallop. I <laughs> run away run away <laughs> um transitioning yeah, before Gibby kills us let's <laughs> redirect I, I, I love the ending not like Joe and Sugar Cake uh, that's like yes. whatever no well, yeah. my favorite is like how much this old millionaire just likes being around Jerry slash Daphne where the, the final exchange is all just like, well, you don't want to marry me. I, I've been living with a man for the past year. Yeah, I forgive you. I can't give you children. Ah, it's okay. We'll adopt. Ah, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. And it just ends on that with the end popping up. I feel like that's so daring for the time period. And it got yes. such a big chuckle out of me when I watched it for the first time. I love that they decided to do that. No, it's one of the most iconic parts of that movie. And I don't think I had realized like that. That's the end. Yeah, that's it. That fade <laughs> to that's black. What they, that's You're what they done. send you home with. It, it's, it's like it's too late. You can't get mad at us. Bye. Right. <laughs> And like I'm still upset that it's the like yeah, but I wish we were there was a resolution, resolution. But sure, fine. The point of this wasn't really to tell like a story. The point of this was to make like a narrative. The point of this was to show the inner thigh of Marilyn Monroe and have some yes! jokes along the way. <laughs> yes, but no, I I love that scene. Like, I, again, like, it's forward for the times, and I don't think it's trying to be, like, what we were saying earlier, like, I don't think it's trying to be, like, deliberately political mm. activist, like, what have you, mm -hmm. but there is the idea that, like, there are still a lot of gay men in Hollywood and oh, other, yeah. like, other queer people in the movie-making business that like it is still something of an inkling of visibility in a time that like would have had anyone like would have had you just extinct sure let alone like eek a sound 
from some far off corner of the country, you know? Yeah. And it's such a like nice just yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what whether like our uh government or society or media admits it, uh queer people have been here for a long time and they've been writing a lot of our media and a lot of our stories and everything. Like yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure people might have had their suspicions about Oscar Wilde once in a while, but like Nobody was brave enough to say anything. <laughs> like it, it just it, it. People are gonna you know put queer media out there, whether people yeah. realize things at at first or not, or things even just with like slight allegory or slight reference to it, because people be queer, Linda. Who would have guessed? And it really is like an interesting examination of like. There's, I mean, obviously the movie is filled with heteronormativity, mm -hmm. but at the same time is that idea of like queerness that is able to exist in the day to day without being like suspect. Sure. Like once they get past the conductor and, and right. the, the, the band manager, nobody really questions it. them. Nobody bats yeah. an eye anymore. Mm -hmm. the, and then they're just along for the ride at that point, which is such a nice like there's no there's no like that is the liar reveal here, which like miss like Miss Doubtfire and Tootsie later play with because liar Ugh. reveal was just something that every fucking movie since the 80s started doing anytime somebody was in a disguise. Fucking yeah. worst plot device in yeah. existence. God, I hate liar reveal. Like there's no liar reveal here. Both liars take off. One takes off multiple disguises <laughs> and and Sugar's OK with it. And yeah. the other one like rips it off and is also met with. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sugar just wants fun, which is great. Right. And like the millionaire is just like, eh, all right, you know, I've been married before. So, hey, my, <laughs> I don't really have standards anymore. I just like you. You know, and I think that's what makes it so like beautifully refreshing, which is weird yeah. to say since this movie like is almost three times older than I am. <laughs> like it because we make so much like and especially you can talk about the whole issue of like commercial media and movie production trying to put itself in a pedestal of like, look, we do things. But Kaylee really the Fool is gay. Is. Right. <laughs> look at our singular homosexual buzz right. light you're seeing. Look at it. Bask in its glory. We left it uh, with just enough editing room that we could take it out into Saudi Arabia and also the Russia and China releases, uh, as well as a few other places. But, you know, look at our great diversity. We are the most diverse. Right. Don't put the black people on the advertising in China. <laughs> it's <laughs> Yeah. It's the unfortunate thing that it's the like this movie had to be coded because of the real world that it existed in, which was a garbage place. But like, this is the kind of just queer media that more actually queer people have like wanted in that sense of like, queerness is not something to be like, look at it. It's there. There it is. <laughs> like it just yeah. exists. That's it. It's just there. Leave it alone. That's not the point of this. Yeah. People don't want that. People want, but I'm a cheerleader and some like or, it. Hot. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. No, like I have been debating like, mm, should we do, but I'm a cheerleader. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in again, in that same vein of just the way that. Oh, shoot. Again, James Summerton had a like really great definition for camp. Camp is usually something that's talked about as like, oh, it's in bad taste. It's ironic, whatever. And yes, I think the irony is true, but it's because I, I like this idea that camp is something that is dripping with aesthetic mm -hmm. and dripping with style in such a way that everything else around it can't help but be a part of that aesthetic and that and if it can't if it's not part of the aesthetic then it is the ground level but still like it, within orbit of responding to the hyper aesthetic the hyper emotion as if 
this is an everyday occurrence. Like you know? melodrama, but make it funny. It's me- exactly no, like it's melodrama. It's why like soap operas are so entertaining in some ways <laughs> because of that heightened nature of aesthetic, of style, of humor or drama or whatever. And the rest of the world goes, yeah, this is even if nobody else is that extreme. Like it's it's the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is camp in that way. Damn it, she took it back to anime. I did. <gasps> Joseph cross dresses to break into the Nazi camp. He does. I, mm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, again, it's that level of like, we have a handful of individuals in this world that are like, again, it's that idea of who's the main character here. And everybody else kind of goes along with either what? Like, wh- either it's weird that I've never seen this power before, but it's not weird that Polner, if you have two feet tall of hair. Like, that's not the weird part. It's the exaggeration of reality and style. Exactly. Yeah. Mix in good humor and irony and good or bad taste based on preference, but it's all about the aesthetic overplacement within the mundane. I fought worse monsters than you for years in Hollywood. I know how to win the hard way. Don't fuck with me, fellas! This ain't my first time at the rodeo. So overall, do y'all think this movie holds up in like modern, modern times? You know what I mean? Shockingly, yes, I would say. I would say that I was surprised as to comparing it to things that we've been more critical of. The joke is not the man is in a dress. The joke is these are dumb con artists and they're getting themselves into more and more ridiculous hijinks because they came yep. up with a new scheme. The joke is on them, not on the dress. So do you think I'd if say. this movie like dropped to like not necessarily today, but in like the last like 20 or so years, do you think it could have done well? I think it's difficult to say that it would have been made the exact same mm-hmm. yeah. because in the same way, that people are always complaining, oh, you couldn't make a Mel Brooks movie today. Well, yes, you yeah, could. Duh, you could. You <laughs> very well could. It's just that, like, different media is made for different yeah. audiences. And I think it would have felt odd if it was released within, you know, the post-millennium time frame yeah, and everything. I, th- I think that in modern days, right, and this, is, mm-hmm. and this is something I had to get over while I was watching it. Yeah. Uh, in modern times, it would have been a lot more zany, I think. Yeah. I think Jack Lemmon's character would have been played by, like, I... Jack's char- or Jack Lemmon's character would have been the Nathan Lane, where the, the supporting actor is like abundantly effeminate and so is the character no let's be real he would have been some black comedian of the day and he would have a lot of more bug eye moments and what you talking about willis shit yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what i mean are you saying that it's going to be chris tucker in the room? it would be like chris tucker or kevin hart or something no please right i think i think it would have been debatable as to like uh, especially with you know like putting a, a black comedian in there if it had been made in like the early 2000s at, at the time at the time you couldn't it, it wouldn't not have made only sense. that but it would have been more derogatory towards queer people and it wouldn't have right. like, played nearly as well because it would have just been like ah gross gay you think i uh, gah my uh. point being is i i i'm of the opinion that this doesn't hold up Very not not in that it's a bad movie nowadays, but Mm. in that let me let me say it this way. I saw that this is on the list of greatest films of all time. And I was like, are you serious? (laughs) You know (laughs) what I mean? But I and I think part of that is a lot of the things that have become conventions in the last 70 years since this movie was made weren't conventions back then. So I see them Mm. as like. Oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen that before. It's like, yeah, because this movie helped start those things, right? Yeah, cliches are only cliches once they become cliches. Right. There's a very weird and interesting sort of thing of like, this movie feels like flavorful and unique and different because of the way it was crafted to explicitly say fuck you to the Hayes Code. Yeah. 
And it's it is interesting to think about like certainly there are still like taboo topics when it comes to making movies and media, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not as limited like directly by a code of things you're not allowed to do on screen. Yeah. Like it's much it's just instead it's more limited to well, what do the people want to see? Mm. What's going to make us money? Here we had something directly responding to a constraint. And that, I think that's sort of the idea is that like we think of so much like a oh, beautiful classic, like timeless art was a response to a constraint being held around it. Like a lot yeah. of like people look at theater like Arthur Miller's one of these great American playwrights. Yeah, he was writing about the Red Scare and like the absurdity of the like obsession of communism in the United States. Yeah. Oh, Tennessee Williams, one of the greatest, like he invented the memory plate. Yes. He was like living trapped in a double life because he couldn't come out as a queer man, supposedly. Um, like all, like all of these things come from places of like, I can't do what I want. I have, this is the only way I can let out some of this or respond to this in any meaningful way. And now when it is very much a like commercial economy and like statistics and audience numbers and polling and doing all these calculations just to figure out what's going to get us an extra thousand or two dollars out of a movie. The algorithm. Uh, you no, know, it is this like it, it exactly feels like just more cliches, more of the same. Mm. We're seeing less try to give a middle finger to the film industry at this point because Oh, why would you do that? That would tank us. Like, we're not going to make any money off of that. Like, meh. It's coming from an era with restraints versus mm -hmm. the only restraint we really have now is, is it good for the algorithm of profit? Yeah. If there's anything I've learned, it's nobody knows anything except the algorithm. That has been this episode of a uh, liberal artist podcast. Thank you for joining us. Join us next time, as we will say every time, abortion rights or human rights. Yeah, no no funny haha joke this time. No, nope, we're done. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. The Liberal Artists Podcast premieres every other Thursday on your favorite podcasting platform. The show is hosted by Bodhi Opapula, Kaylee Horowitz, and Andy Gibson. You can find the show at LibArtistsPod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks to White Hot for performing the theme song Reflect, which can be found on freebeats.io. Now, I'm off to go exploring, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, I'll find a sheep that I can call my own. Good day. You like jazz? Do you like jazz? That's the that's that's the stinger. That's how we end it. The stinger B movie. Oh! God damn it! Fuck! I'm hitting stop. <laughs> <laughs>